thank you people for coming it's um nice to see some people i know and some people that i don't know so it's always nice to have that mixture i'm talking about um writing about mental health i'm mostly thinking about um fiction uh, which is what i write but it's possible that it'll apply to things like plays poetry and memoir but yeah, I mean, my background is as, as a clinical psychologist and after being a psychologist for 25 years, I guess it's it's not surprising that um, mental health should feature in my fiction. And what I'm going to do is talk about um, how that theme is addressed in the characters if three of well, sorry, three of my novels, my only three novels, one of which has not yet been, been published. Um, so it's having its first outing here tonight. Um, and I'm going to share a, a framework for thinking about character, um, a character with a mental health issue, and that it should really be something that any author could use regardless of whether you have expertise in, in a mental health area. Just thinking about um, ha planning a piece of, of work around mental health, um, I think you'd just be asking yourself the same kinds of questions that you would ask yourself as, um, about any themes in, in writing. So for example, you know, what function does this serve within the story? So we're, we're prioritising the story or, or rather than um, social issues, whatever. How do I draw on my own experience to get into the character? What do I need to research? How do I avoid cliches? And what tone do I want to convey? Well, first thing to say sort of overall is that to remember that um, empathy is a writer's superpower. So it, if you're thinking of your character from within rather than looking at them from the outside, that should to a degree help you to steer away from stereotypes. And, you know, I think we've um, one stereotype that I'm going to come two is in this book I don't know, and I'll tell you what it is um, Jane Eyre st stereotype of the the raving lunatic um, in the attic um, another stereotype but the other extreme is um, somebody so, so feeble and uh, scared that they're scared of her, her own shadow but also you don't want to um, go to the other extreme of having a character who is all virtue. So we need characters with flaws. This is a complete aside, but I do a guided walk in the Peak District through um, Jane Eyre territory. And that there's, if people are interested in that, there are still, I think, four places left for the work that's happening in mid June. So Jane Eyre, how many, I, I'm presuming a lot of people have read Jane Eyre or are familiar with the story, yeah. Um, and there's one character in it then, um, do you remember the character called Bertha? So Bertha is um, Edward Rochester, the romantic, Byronic hero's um, first wife. So she is the person who's kept um, in the, the attic. So I think Jane is a marvellous novel, apart from the characterisation of um, Bertha is, is very stereotyped. To be fair, when um, Charlotte Bronte was writing the novel, people who were mentally disturbed could well have been kept locked up in an attic as as Bertha was um, but even so she seems to me that she's less of a character than a piece of gothic scenery 
when she, especially when she goes a bit berserk and attacks a visitor in the night. She's also a plot point. So she's, a, she's an obstacle on Jane's journey to true love. Um, and she's, she's an obstacle that doesn't tarnish the hero's reputation because as, as she's depicted, we don't actually sort of think of Mr. Rochester as a big mist, a potential big mist, but really he's a, he's a normal man who deserves a much better wife than the mad woman that he married. So he, he deserves Jane. So that, that is, is one way of looking at um, people with mental health issues, but there is another way around it. Um, the Wild Saga so see by Jean Rees, which is another take on um, the story of um, Bertha in, in Jane Eyre. So um, we then see the character very different, differently. I mean, to, to start with, she has a different name that she's 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 called Antoinette. Anyway, so so but what we how she, we see her in the novel, in um, Wild Side Guys so see, is that we see her development from her poverty-stricken childhood in the Caribbean. Um, to a loveless marriage, which is a marriage of convenience, and she's more or less sold into it. And so our sympathies switch. We might not, we might still understand how difficult it is for Edward Rochester, but if we see, we begin to see um, Antoinette as a person rather than a just this mad thing. And my point isn't really about whether the sequel is better than the original, but really that if you want to write about mental health issues, take the Wild Sargasso Sea as your model rather than Jane Eyre. So thinking about getting into, getting into character. If your character's using psychiatric services, you might want to know about things like diagnosis and medication and the routines of a hospital ward. However, unless this is an important part of your narrative, and, and if that is the case, then you really do need to be spot on. But I think you can work around that, and um, I think that you're strong, your story can be stronger for it. And that's because like any label that we put on a person, diagnosis can be distancing. And that's the last thing that we want in a piece of fiction where we want to narrow the gap between the reader and the character. Now, fortunately, there's, there's a model that um, psychologists and other psychological practitioners use instead of diagnosis um, the use of a process called formulation to make sense of the client's difficulties and although practitioners might vary quite a lot in how they do so they've got one thing in common and the good news is that that's not a world away from what writers do. So psychologically, we can perceive of mental ill health as the outcome of an interaction between a pre-existing vulnerability and a particular stress. Now, both of these can be based on biology but it's it's really much more interesting, I think, in, in fiction if they're about psychological factors and life events. And even if you don't show any of your character's backstory, a writer still needs to know it. So to bring your character to life on the page, you need to know how they got to the starting blocks of the story. 
I'm going to tell you about how um, how the, the vulnerability stress model underpins the main characters in my three novels, each of whom have mental health issues. But I should say that I didn't kind of plan them as like, you know, here's the vulnerability, here's the stress. I, I think it's because I, you know, I internalise that way of thinking about things, which um, a lot of writers also so do. But I, it, I found it quite interesting. My first novel was is called Sugar and Snails, and um, this is about a woman called Diana who's kept her past identity secret for thirty years. And her story starts with a crisis when it seems that her relationship with boyfriend Simon is beyond repair. Her reaction is is quite extreme. She takes a Stanley knife and cuts her arm. And even without knowing the details of that breakup, the stressor is clear, as are I, th I think anyway, as are her mental health issues as someone who self-harms. But it's not until about halfway through the novel that the reader is shown the full extent of her vulnerability. Having felt a misfit since childhood, she's desperately lonely, but terrified of showing her true self. And there's more than one reason why she's felt a misfit. But she might have developed into a more secure adult if her parents had been less critical when she was young. And I chose to introduce that idea gently rather than through showing a big bust up or something. So in the first chapter, um, there's a very short flashback to her mother taking her to Lourdes for a miracle to fix her. But what if she wasn't actually broken? And I think although Diana's, um, I was going to say they're, they're not so extreme, but maybe, maybe they, they are if she's sort of self-harming. Um, but what, what I was thinking was that there's a lot of that around mental health and particularly around psychiatric models um, of really people being broken and needing to be fixed, whereas a more psychological way of looking at it would be to think of their overall strengths and, and weaknesses and thinking about how to build the strengths to compensate for, for the weaknesses, which is a bit different. So we, we, we see her, you know, her, her family and herself feeling that she needs to be fixed. Um, further on, she shares a memory of as a three-year-old in what was a seemingly happy situation when she's dancing, um, yet she has to hide, she has to do it alone and particularly hide it from her mother. So by the time puberty looms, she's no one to support her through her fears and confusion. And so already vulnerable, her first experience of self-harm is triggered by the prospect of moving up to secondary school and the disturbing physical changes of adolescence. So I'm going to read a short piece about how that leads to her first experiences of self-harm as, as a child. Rumours blew around the playground. If you were a girl, you were destined to get dreadful stomach cramps, severe enough to lead to bleeding between your legs, and you'd have to go around with a mini nappy in your knickers. If you were a boy, you were fated to get odd sensations in your cock, twitching and swelling till it forced its way out of your underpants. You'd start to dream of women's breasts and the liquid thick like sour milk, would leave a smelly white patch on the sheets that told your mother you'd been thinking dirty. Boy or girl, the indignity was unavoidable. As sure as the school bus and black woolen blazers 
with an embroidered badge on the breast pocket. The female way seemed marginally preferable. All that blood and pain could be a secret wound, like a saint's stigmata. I found where Patricia, my sister, hid her Dr. White's in the airing cupboard and made my plan. It was a Sunday afternoon. My dad was out hiking, Patricia doing her homework at her boyfriend's, Trevor playing at being gorillas with his mates, and my mother downstairs watching an ealing comedy with her feet up on the buffet. I took the bread knife from the kitchen and crept upstairs. In the bathroom, I bolted the door and changed into clean pyjamas, the closest I had to a surgical gown. I tore open a fresh packet of Dr. White's and laid them beside the knife. I removed my pyjama bottoms and draped them over the side of the bath. The ache matched all the rumours about period pain. The blood confirmed all reports about the mess. The blood kept flowing, no matter how many sanitary towels I used to mop it up. Poor Diana. My next, I've gone into my next novel underneath. Um, so I wanted to do something different um, with underneath my second novel. Um, and the main character here, um, Steve, is not only disturbed, but he's, he's disturbing. And a short prologue shows him as a, a jailer, keeping someone captive in the cellar of his house. But for over half the novel, he presents himself as ordinary and invites the reader to accept him as ordinary too. Others have mental health issues. His mother with dementia, his girlfriend, Liesl, haunted by her mother's suicide. Steve, is perfectly fine. But like Diana, Steve has vulnerabilities from childhood. When he was born, his mother was grieving the death of his father, her husband, and couldn't give him the attention that he required as a baby and a, and a young child. And I'm sure the, the impact of this in flashback scenes from childhood but the adult Steve is completely in denial. And for a while, it, this gives him confidence, but it's not sustainable. So in contrast to, my, um, to Diana in Sugar and Snails, he's, actually, he's less anxious, um, but he's got further to fall. And so what causes Steve's eventual unraveling is the interplay between his inherent vulnerability, ordinary life events, and an element of chance. And it starts with what appears to be a fairly mature decision. Um, he's, he's, quite, he's kind of he's a 40-year-old um, adolescent in, in the story, so he's, he's, he's Come, he decides to settle down. He's, he's been travelling for 20 years. He gives up his, his itinerant lifestyle to, to settle down. But what he doesn't realise is that his years of, tra of travelling have served to avoid having to connect with an inner sense of homelessness and buying a house can't resolve that. So he's living with, with Lisa. Um, but when she threatens to leave him, he's enraged. And any of us who um, have experienced relationship breakdown can empathise, or certainly I could with, with what enabled me to write his character. Um, but I hope there's a difference between us and, and Steve, and that while 
um, any of us might imagine locking our partner up to stop them going. Um, I think only Steve would go that far. He also, though, it is also down to chance to a degree because he's he's um, he's bought happens to have bought a house that has a, a cellar, so some of it is about opportunity. So um, abandonment throws Steve's mind into turmoil, and I start to show this about two thirds of the way through the novel after Liesel has um, issued an ultimatum. When they got together, both of them were very clear that they didn't want children. However, she has changed her mind and she delivers an ultimatum. If he can't agree to start a family, then she's leaving him. And in this sh short extract, um, Steve, has what um, could be just an ordinary nightmare, but it is also a, a foretaste of the psychosis that is to, to come towards the end of the story. So this is him, him sort of on the verge between sleep and, and wakefulness. And often that is a, a, a strange time for any of us, when, when we might have unusual, when we're most likely to have, if we're going to have um, psychotic-like experiences, it's that kind of on that boundary between sleep and, and wakefulness, when they might occur in people who are otherwise um, not considered mentally ill. So here's Steve. Nothing to hang on to except terror, no certainties, no thoughts, no one to save me and hardly a me to be saved. I was wiped out as if the teacher had chalked my name on the board and rubbed it out. Nothing to show I'd ever existed but a dusting of white on black. No point calling out, instead I should make myself small quiet, inoffensive, merge myself with the blankness of the blackboard until the danger swept past. Yet I couldn't hold all the bits of myself together. I was all loose pieces, an unwieldy shape. I was a squiggle of lines, a tangle of barbed wire, a muddy puddle, nothing that made sense. I had no shield, no shelter, no way to brace myself against attack. I heard a lamb's bleat, an anguished squeak, my own voice betraying me to the monsters beyond. Kindness wrapped itself around me, flesh cradled mine. Not cold, not hard, not loud or sharp. Perhaps I might, against all odds, survive. The touch of skin on skin, arms around my body, a sweet smell I recognised but couldn't name. Shh, you're safe now, a whispering like a breeze. If I discovered who she was, she might help me find a route back to myself. Are you Miss Fothergill? You've had a nightmare, go back to sleep. And that, just for clarification, because it's out of context, it can be difficult to tell, but that's, that was his, Miss Father, Father Gill was his teacher from school who was kind to him, and that was Liesel reassuring him when, when he woke up. I'm not going to give a, a, I don't think I can give you a very good answer to, to this, because I sort of don't know, but it's a good point to, to bring it in, because both of those novels were in first person, and my next novel that I'm coming to, I love you, my next novel, um, is in the third person, but it's quite a, a close third person. So in a way, you've got a, a, an opportunity to see if I manage to get closer. And uh, it's, a, it's a huge area, isn't it, really, sort of um, first or 
third person and since we're among friends to be perfectly honest why i chose the third person for my um next my, for my third novel is that there are actually three point of view characters and i didn't think i could so easily write three different first person voice voices within that novel i think in third person gives you an opportunity to bring in another perspective more doesn't it but i quite like to try and get that other side in through the character's point of view um because I, I mean, it's quite a challenge, really, but yeah, you can't. And, and, but I think you can do as much um, with a close third person as, as a, with the first. Tracy asking, um, does it come from experience with, with my patients? And um, first of all, is um, I would never, and cannot ever sort of professionally use a story that somebody has given me as a client from a fiction as interesting as that that might be to do it's just not ethical but of course I'm influenced by all of the people that I've talked to um and they just kind of filter in don't they really so it's, so it's a bit more like that however again coming into this novel this is much more based on my experience because it's set in a psychiatric hospital, um, a long stay psychiatric hospital, um, which I've kind of fictionalized. So it's much more, that's more direct. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly in um, in Sugar and Snails, my first novel kind of people, some people just did assume because I was a clinical psychologist, the character was based on a patient, but actually, um yeah she wasn't really she wasn't just that so no I'm, I'm quite a narcissistic person really so I kind of draw on a lot of my own experience really of course goes into it a lot more than I might feel comfortable saying but yeah let's see um so yeah let me tell yeah going back to um these two the, these first two novels I hope that you're getting the sense that um, it's not just any old vulnerability and it's not just some random stress that cause that we might think of causing the, the difficulties. So while we could say, yes, some people can be considered more vulnerable than others and some types of stresses are traumatic enough that would make anyone crack. But it's really less about the quantity of pressure someone's under than what it represents for them. And so it's about the, me the meaning. Yeah. And But sometimes we, we are complex bids, but sometimes that just doesn't seem to be addressed in some novels, I think. And maybe I see that more, particularly in thrillers where it's more, and perhaps other um, genres where it, it's much more determined by plot than than character. I don't know. Um, but it, adolescence is a trigger for Diana because adolescence triggers, uh, raises questions of ident identity and she's never felt confident in hers. And for Steve, in the, underneath, um, prospective fatherhood triggers him because um, he's never confronted his feelings about growing up without a father and with an emotionally distant mother. But as I said before, chance also plays a, a part. And Steve might well have been a law-abiding citizen, citizen if Liesl hadn't changed her mind about wanting children. So, of course, it really boils down to it's always the woman's fault which we already knew, knew anyway. So coming on to um, this novel, with Diane and Steve in my first two novels, I've created characters with psychological issues 
that can fit under the umbrella of mental ill health. But it's the other way around with, with Matty in this novel, Matilda Windsor's Coming Home. Um, because she's been defined by her diagnosis. But I want to show readers that she's much, much more. So Matty's story is that she was admitted to Gillside Psychiatric Hospital, the famous hospital, in 1939 at the age of 20. And when the novel begins, 50 years later, you don't need a mental health background to recognise that she's mentally ill. But the question is, was she mad when she arrived or has the institution driven her insane? And the narrative throws up various possibilities consistent with that vulnerability stress model but I leave it to readers to make up your own minds. What I'm more interested in is how actually her illness, which um, does get a psychiatric diagnosis of schizophrenia, which is um, very commonly distributed around people. It's a kind of a catch-all for severe mental illness, really. Um, so she gets that diagnosis, um, but I'm interested in how her 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 madness, let's say, um, enables her to tolerate the injustice of being shut away for her entire adult life. So I just want to flag up another psychological issue here about another important dif difference between psychological and psychiatric frameworks of mental ill health. That Psychologists don't tend to classify people's thoughts and behaviours as symptoms, but to be curious about what function those symptoms serve. So going back to Diana again in Sugar and Snails, she might cut herself because it's the only way that she can let out the psychological pain. And Steve keeps a woman captive as a way of denying that he's alone. So if you're wanting to um, create a character with some mental health issues that they then recover from, then a good way to, to find out whether that's a credible, you've got a credible route, is to thinking about the function of their, of their symptoms or disabilities um, should help that determine, it, how, determine how it might be alleviated if that's what you want you want to do. So if the, your character can recover when those needs are met in a healthier way. So back to Matty, um, as I said, this is a, a three, three points of view in this, but the, Matty's the, the main character. Um, she sees herself as a society hostess of a magnificent country estate. And these what would, would be called grandiose delusions. They give her a positive outlook on life and make her more entertaining company for the reader than, say, someone who's depressed but might be much more in tune with direct reality. She's actually, um, she's my favourite character um, of my characters I've created, um, not just in this novel. And I'll give you an example of how her mind works. Um, in this extract, she wakes up one morning after moving to a different part of the hospital from where she was before, sort of what, at what we'd call the, the back wards, um, to a, a part of the hospital where um, patients are working towards discharge. Despite her diligence in tidying her thoughts on retiring to bed, Matty awakes to disarray. Who has put her mind in a muddle and how did they penetrate her skull? It is as if a kitten has whisked its way into a sewing box and woven a cat's cradle with the thread. When she dares open her eyes, it is obvious 
something larger and fiercer than a baby cat is responsible. A team of workmen have shifted the walls, shrinking the room to half its normal size and trimming the beds to four, all but hers unoccupied. How could they have accomplished such a feat without waking her? Matty has to concede it feels cosier, but they should have consulted her first. Buck up, says her mother. All will become clear in due course. Indeed, the moment she curbs her curiosity, it comes through to her that she has moved into a more congenial section of the house. Morning, Matty. Ready for breakfast? The person addressing her from the foot of the bed looks too jolly to be a guest. But why would a maid wear a sweater and slacks instead of the standard blue deck dress? I'm Karen, your primary nurse. We met yesterday. Mine? Matty has gone up in the world if she's been allotted a lady in waiting. A pity she's so sloppily turned out. Did my mother not provide you a uniform? A dark frock flatters the fuller figure. The maid laughs. I don't know about your mother, but Chuck House went into Mufti to break down barriers between residents and staff. She cannot consent to staff exchanging their tidy uniforms for androgynous leisure wear. The distinctions reassure both servants and guests of their place. But the lower orders can be tetchy when confronted. With youth on her side, her maid, Karen, or is it Kitty, will adapt. Although obese, she has a perfect peachy complexion. It would be amusing to seek to improve her. Under Matty's tutelage, the girl might progress to one of the grander houses, Dale Main or Leavens Hall. To note that um, I'm really pleased I could do this this week um, because it's Mental Health Awareness Week. And I'm sure everyone's conscious of the stigma around mental ill health and wouldn't want to add to it. So I was going to suggest some genres or styles of writing that it's best to avoid. And then I started to panic because it looked as if I could be accused of breaking my own rules or guidelines. So beware of men making mental illness seem comic. I think we'd agree with that perhaps to a degree. So from the, from the outside, delusions can be amusing. But is it disrespectful to treat them this way? With, with Matty, and I don't know if you, th if you thought that was funny or not funny or, or what, but I didn't, I didn't set out to make her funny. And I was alarmed when I first found out that she was. And she's, I mean, it's only mildly, you know, sort of light humour. Um, and it was actually a workshop that I did quite a few years ago at the studio with Kate Fox, who's a, a successful comedian, um, and that gave me some confidence that it was okay to to um, to put your humour into to subject a serious subject. And then early readers suggested that the the humour can highlight the underlying darkness. And, and actually to me and to a lot of people, she's, she's more heroic than foolish really, because she is definitely making the best of a very difficult situation. And also sometimes the, the joke is on the supposedly sane characters. So the staff who actually don't get the hints in her con Voluted messages and her, her, her um, some of the things that she she says that they miss, but the reader sees that because we we kind of there's another angle on her story. 
and also the Upright Citizens campaigning against having former mental patients move, moving into their, their neighbourhood. So, yeah, and that's just, I agree, Tracy's just pointing out that, that Maud in Elizabeth is, is missing, um, is very, yeah, very real and, and, and funny. And she was really one of the strong influences, again, on um, how, um, how, yeah, so how I wrote this character. The second issue is it relates to um, this novel, the darker novel underneath. Um, beware of making the mentally ill character the villain. But one of the things that really, really annoys me, and I don't know if you noticed, but when um, someone with a severe mental illness commits a violent crime, they always give the diagnosis if they have one. And as if the implication is that the, um, the label explains the assault. Yeah, in fact, um, someone with a psychiatric diagnosis is actually much more likely to be the victim, and that isn't it isn't really an explanation of um, violent act action. So, what about Steve? Well, as one reviewer said, um, Steve seems extra creepy because he appears so normal initially, and um, so, you know, you too could have Steve move in or move into Steve's house, you know. Um, but it, it, it's, although he's got pockets of vulnerability, it's his um, criminality actually that pushes him over the edge. Did I feel any, I did feel, thank you, Ian, yeah, I did feel sympathy for Steve quite, quite a lot. and. When I was writing it, um, my husband asked me, did, did the story have a happy ending? And I couldn't really, I couldn't answer that because it depends whose side you're on. And I find it quite difficult, even though I've got like, he's a horrible character. I find it quite difficult that people don't don't like like him, and I find that quite a lot, really, because I'm looking from the inside. And obviously, I also have to have a distance from them so that they can get their come up and so whatever, whatever or be punished. But um, yeah, I did, I did have sympathy. My favourite character, character, Matty, Nikki. Thank you. Well. Um, I do, yeah, I do let go of the characters that um, with, with Diana, my, um, my first character who I spent a lot of time, time with, and I did something quite recently of a, a wrote a, um, a, story, a little story based on um, another character in the novel because it's just for a bit of fun for on a, a blog, and there was a discussion about it and people saying oh you could do this you could do this you could do this you know all, all these ideas there for where I could take it but I thought but I thought kind of not no I wasn't interested so yeah I kind of let let those people go my characters are often located geographically not necessarily geographically in, in the novel but geographically where I've thought most about them when I've been out and about and there's a particular part of the Peak District called Bretton Clough where I often find I speak, I think about Diana again, again when I go there, it sort of just comes. So she comes back to me there and I'm thinking, oh, where she, and I don't thinking about where she is now because, um, the novel, I think, set in 2004, but I, and it was published in 2015. So there's a lot of time for that. But I have to say about Nikki's question about, about Matty is I have not let go of Matty. Um, because, and it, I mean, I don't know if it was to do with um, 
the pandemic, although as I was saying to Tom earlier, it hasn't made a lot of difference to me because I don't actually get out much. But I was um, doing some edits this time, yeah, this time last year, just finishing off um, the edits. And that was re a really good pandemic project because I was focused and it was distracting enough. But on the other hand, it, did, it wasn't, it didn't ask, require me to um, create anything new. And, but when, when I'd finished and sent it off to my publisher, I thought, oh, great. I had a few days where I thought, oh, great, that's done. And then I started to miss her very much. And, um, and it's interesting because she was 70 in um, 1990. Yeah, um, I just and and because she'd had all of these um, these experiences, you know, all, all this medication and things, which isn't good for people's physical health at all. Um, I assumed she would be dead, and then I discovered that she's she was a hundred during the pandemic, and there is a sequel. I work, so I'm working on the, and the, so I've set, I mean, it, it's set in the pandemic, so I don't know if that people will find that unbearable to read about, but she's in the care, she's in a care home in the pandemic, and she um, discovers that she's responsible for the transatlantic slave trade. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite enjoying, enjoying that. And yeah, it is a, it is a part, that's, that, I mean, Nikki, that's, that's a, I agree with that point. It's a part of you that you put outside of yourself, but um, it's kind of outside and, and inside, but then maybe. And the other thing is that I think, particularly when I do talks about sort of like threads through this, my stories, I find that, well, I'm just writing the same story over and over again. There's always that kind of sense that you, you kind of keep coming back to it. So, yeah. I'm published by um, Small Independent Press, Inspired Quill, based in Derby. And it's a very, very, you know, it's a micro press, but they're very, very nice to work with. Um, and they're very much into ethics and treating their um, their authors well, um, and they need they need all our support as well because they don't actually um, as a lot of small presses don't they, they they it's a very kind of hand to mouth operation very difficult to get published. Um, yeah, I just, just, yeah, it is. It's, you know, it, it's, um, you get so many rejections and, and sometimes that is because the work isn't ready. Certainly, I mean, with my first novel, and it was, sometimes it, it's um, a disadvantage to get some positive, a positive response early on because I got, um, yeah, very, very kind of positive response from a um, of a very, very different version of this. So I just thought I was just about there. And then I had a very good positive response from an agent's assistant who had read the whole thing. But then I was still I was, for years after that, I was I was still trying to get it published and, and working on it and, re and revising it. So I, I think, but sometimes I think I think we just under some people do, because I do know people who have actually, you know, got their first novel published and not, you know, worked on it a couple of years, and they think they think that's a long time. Because I was seven seven years for each for um, for my first two novels from getting the idea to publication, and Matilda Windsor is is. Um, was was a lot quicker. That was six and a half years. So I think it ta it takes a long time for me any anyway to to get it done. Yeah, very very hard.